Good morning, everyone. Uh, Sungwoo, Sungwoo, can you hear me? 네, 교수님 잘 들립니다. Junsang, good morning. 네, 안녕하세요, 교수님. Okay, nice to see you. Um, uh, probably uh, uh, this Wednesday, I'm gonna give you overview picture of deep reinforcement learning. That will be the really overview of our uh, class in this semester. Uh, I'm going to explain the basic idea of deep reinforcement learning to explain the case of AlphaGo Go game. So I, I hope that all of you join the class on Wednesday. Then you will get overall idea about what's going on in deep reinforcement learning. Um, probably from next week, I'm going to in, I'm going to introduce some several uh, 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 machine learning uh, models such as uh, uh, RNN, CNN, uh, advisory uh, general trip advisory network, and so on. So I'm gonna use the class of today to give you basic uh, background to understand what's going on on the real uh, machine learning models and deep reinforcement learning models. So, um, so from Wednesday to end of probably April will be the most important part of the class. Up to now, I spend most of time to give you mathematical background to understand the models which we will discuss later on. Now, this is Monday, so I'm going to spend a little bit more time on the uh, activation function and cost functions. And later on, I will introduce some methodologies related to data pre preparations. <clears throat> I will spend a little bit time to discuss the softmax. It is a, one of the kind of activation function being used at final layer. It will usually uh, improve the fast training. It, it can be used in RNN and CNN, that is the typical, very typical uh, machine learning model being used in later on reinforcement learning or deep reinforcement learning. So I want to spend a little bit time to discuss about this activation function. Activation function, let's assume that we have L minus one layer. And let's assume that we have L layer, last layer, and we have final output layer. Y1, Y2, Y3. Uh, let's assume that this is S1, S2, S3. And let's assume this is H1, H2, and H3. This will be connected like that. There will be many connections and it can be represented by matrix Wij. And then this at the final layer, this output S will be connected to Y1 and S2 will be connected to Y2 and S3 will be connected to Y3. Then the relationship which describes the softmax function can be represented by this. So if you have if you have output S1 and S2 and X3, you will make a summation of exponential S1. So this means exponential S1 plus exponential S2 plus exponential S3. 
this is the sum of exponential of all these three terms. And this is, for example, uh, this is exponential SI. So that means summation of y1 plus y2 plus y3 is becoming one. So this softmax output, let's assume that this is the final output, then this has more probable contributions. This softmax uh, activation function at the final stage makes output is more close to probability distribution because summation of output oh. is equal to one. And Y1 is really probability of output Y1 and Y2 is really probability of Y2 and Y3 is really probability of Y3. And in the normal case of output layer, it, it could be um, sigmoid function or Lello output function, output summation of output is not necessary to, to become one. But if you enforce a softmax or output layer, if you add one more output layer, y1, y2, y3 with the softmax uh, function, then you can enforce that all summation of y1, y2, and y3 is becoming one. I think uh, this, this makes more fast training. Let's give you some example. Let's assume that you have sigmoid output S1 is equal to let's assume 0 0.8808 as let's assume S2 is 0.7685. Let's assume S3 is 0.8. 9820, then absolute maximum uh, is hard max is saying that this is one, then and the soft max is 0 0.1131, 0 0.0508, 0.8360. So if you keep this sigmoid output as the final output layer, you, you're gonna have these numbers. And then you have to define host function. And then you have to do the back propagation using the uh, gradient descent. Some other cases, probably you can you add one more output layer that na is named as max. Actually your target output will be one, that is the max, but in real practical case, we, in many cases, we are using softmax function. In that case, uh, we apply this equation at S1 and S2 and X3. And as I said that Y, J is, if you apply this equation up, up here, then you're gonna get this softmax output. The very particular feature of this softmax output is that summation of y1, y2, and y3. And you see that compared to sigmoid output, it has more dominant distribution saying that you look at that the difference between S1 and S3 are not significant, but in this case, uh, the difference between y1 and y3 are much bigger. So um, it really helps more efficient training. So in many cases of in real models, we are going to use probably in May, for example, I'm going to give you lectures on RNN and CNN, RNN, CNN, and again, that those are very typical uh, machine learning model. I'm going to use many times softmax functions. But please remember that in order to define cost functions and cost function and back propagation, you should be able to do the deriv derivatives to apply the gradient descent. So later on, 
in my lectures, I'm going to give you some examples in which I'm going to derive some de derivative of gradient descent of the softmax function. Another type, uh, type of cost function, which I'm going to spend a little bit time today is low likelihood function. That is defined by this formula. Let's assume that you have softmax output y1, y2, and y3. Let's assume that this is the really target true number. Then you apply c is equal to minus log y3. That, that means that let's take a look at the curve. If y3 is really the uh, true number, targeted number, that should be number one. If you, your output is not, is somewhere near here, then you have to apply the cost function. Cost function will be very high and gradient will be very, slope will be very high. So it will have very fast uh, training and near Zero, but it will uh, on, it will continue until uh, your y3 is becoming to zero. That is when cost function is equal to zero. That is very useful a uh, cost function in this case. So <clears throat> let me briefly summarize today. Um, Sometimes uh, we, we are going to use the softmax function for the activation function, then summation of output will become one. So it will help very fast training. In coupled with this uh, softmax function, in many cases in my class later on, I'm going to use the cost function named as locally likelihood function. In locally likelihood function, we choose a uh, y3, which is actually target output, that is number one, the others should be zero, that is the labeled output. And our, our softmax output should be uh, become as close as possible to number one. How you do that? You apply the gradient descent and you update weight matrices. And for these simple cases with the softmax and the locally likelihood cost functions, this is the actual shape of the cost function that is minus a log yi. So you may start with some point here, there, then you keep training until your cost is becoming one. That is uh, what your output softmax output is becoming one. That is a point that cost is becoming zero. Uh, actually, this is a part of the entropy function but in, in the, with the softmax function, we mostly we are using log likelihood function. Um, by using, by discussing this uh, softmax and log likelihood cost function, I'd like to close at my lecture on the fundamentals of deep machine learning. And, uh, Teaching or TA will distribute this lecture notes to you. And if you are more interested in, you can look into textbooks or of some publication to see the meaning of all these activation functions and cost functions. But I think this, my lecture could be a good starting point to start the deeper study. Now, uh, let's move on to the next course, Machine Learning Design and Performance Improvement. I want to give you overall view of classes which we have given you in this month. 
And then I'm going to discuss more about the data preparations. Let's talk about what is performance of machine learning. Uh, these are my own uh, the descriptions. Number one, I think the most important part of the machine learning is accuracy. If the output of machine learning is not as good as human beings, sometimes it may be useless. You ca we can apply the RNN to, to make some writing or to understand our speed natural processing languages, but accuracy should be understanding of machine learning to understand human languages should be as good as maybe 20 years old boy or girls. So I think accuracy, or if you apply CNN model, if you are developing CNN model, uh, you can show them picture and it has to recognize whether it is tiger and cat. It has to be more accurate than human being. So accuracy is, I think, number one requirement. Also, we have to minimize the resources. Resources means data, fund, computing, power, and memory and electrical power, electric power. With the given accuracy, let's assume that we have uh, another model which are using less resources, less data, less funding, less computing power, less memory, less electrical power will be much more competitive. So in your term project also, I'd like to recommend you to think about what is the advantages of your model, proposed model, even though that is the very primitive model to be used in, in the engineering world. But to be a good presentation, you have to mention about accuracy and resources in your model. Also, you have to say data size should be small. Also, you have to have very high speed and inference and training. If you are developing AlphaGo deep reinforcement learning, you may spend a minute or three minutes before you decide next stone. But if you are uh, developing deep reinforcement learning for automotive vehicles, you have to make a decision in millisecond. You cannot take a second or two second or three second. Then only there will be a car accident. So speed is also a big concern. Also cost should be a concern. And next one is flexibilities, expandability, expandability, the usability. I think these are also very important considerations. Flexibility means, I think, if you develop certain uh, machine learning model, it is recommended to use other applications have, uh, by applying very small modifications. If you have to develop completely new machine learning model, it's really expensive. So expandability means that you apply your machine learning model for certain size of data. For example, you develop machine learning algorithm for a class of 100 students, but if you can easily expand that to 1,000 or 10,000 students' uh, cases, that's very, very useful. Expandability is very useful. Also, in the same sense, usability is very uh, important concern. So when you are writing a paper, uh, if, you, uh, if that is a very fast and accurate for certain environment and certain cases, that could be a good uh, paper uh, as far as you can uh, say some originalities and contributions and creativities. But if you want to develop some commercially uh, efficient machine learning model, 
I think this number one, two, three, four, five, six is very important considerations. So when you are, you will present at the final presentation in this, in this class, you will present some new machine learning models, but if you can consider or discuss some of these aspects of your machine learning model, that will be good. I think I strongly recommend that. Even for, for students who are pursuing master degree or PhD degree, or even engineers who are developing these machine learning models, I strongly believe, uh, suggest to consider these uh, considerations. There are many uh, ways to improve performance. We then performance improvement. Of the NN machine learning on the given computing power. So let's assume that we have DNN here and we have electrical power. So of course we have to uh, decide the uh, hyperparameters parameters, we have to decide hyperparameters, and we also have to determine the model, and then we have to train, we have to con conduct the train and test. So during this process, there might be some method of which I would like to uh, recommend you to apply uh, this. Data pre-process. Sometimes this data is given from the internet or some company may have internal data or sometimes you can create using your own computers. Let's assume you are developing deep reinforcement learning Alpargo algorithm. You play a game uh, between you have between your two different models. But anyway, there are many different cases which we, we can obtain the data, but Nature data itself is not good enough. Sometimes you have to uh, uh, manipulate or you have to apply pre-process to make your uh, machine learning fast and accurate. Second uh, approach is data augmentation. and generation. Sometimes if you do not have enough data, in most cases, if you have more data, you can do the more iterations of forward propagation and backward propagation. Probably your machine learning is becoming smarter and more accurate, but sometimes you do not have enough data. So you can apply the data augmentation method, or sometimes you have to generate the data from the arti uh, artificial, um, virtual artificial reality and virtual realities, augmented reality and virtual reality. In the computer environment, you can generate the data, additional data. So the consideration uh, is drop out. to reduce complexities. Sometimes you start with very sub complicated uh, machine learning model, but in uh, there are some cases where uh, complicated machine learning model does not necessarily give you more accurate and fast result. So I'm going to discuss a little bit about a uh, dropout method and first approach is parameter search method. Search method. And next one is I would say overfitting 
problem, we have to consider that to to, in order to improve your performance of your machine learning model. And also you, you can think about only stop method. And also we can think about advanced gradient descent method. There might be many other methods and you can see the uh, recent conferences and publication to look into that. Uh, but these are very text style uh, method. So when you are developing your machine learning model, you can think about this kind of uh, approaches. And uh, during the class uh, today, I'm going to talk about these issues today. Let's think about data, trend, data distributions. Let's assume you have data, data X, which has this Gaussian type of distribution. And there are other cases where let's assume that you have data, which has very discrete type of distributions. Um, which type of data you're gonna use for your training purpose? And in this case, probably you can choose certain uh, area and you can choose this area as an uh, input data but in this case, probably you can choose some separately, you can choose that. You can choose data. So my personal, I'm not good in a data scientist, but I strongly believe that you have to choose training data set and also you have to have validation data set. And finally, you may have test data set. I would say you, you choose certain data set, probably 80% of your data for training purpose when you are developing machine, machine learning model. And this one is probably 10% of data you can use that machine learning model verification. This validation data is really uh, useful for uh, your model verification because you update or you modify the data. And this was the final machine learning test. Probably you can choose 10%. So to make a good reliable machine learning model using the data, I think my personal belief is that it is very important to have data distributions. How are you going to, so uh, that's why sometimes we need a good uh, state, uh, background of statistics. How are we going to choose Probably, let's assume this is training data is A and validation as B and test data is C. All A, B, C could be same area, or sometimes you can separate. Let's assume that you may choose data A, training data set from this area and validation uh, a data from B area and test area from C. So I'm not sure at this moment what is the best but you have to spend a lot of time when you are collecting the data for your training data set. As I mentioned before, you can generate this data, obtain this data from your computer simulations and AI VR environment or from the internet. So I think if you do not have a good 
uh, or reliable sets of data, you cannot train the machine learning. The beauty of I'm, uh, on Wednesday, probably I'm going to spend more time on Wednesday about AlphaGo and deep reinforcement learning. Their key methodology is how to generate their own data. Sometimes they, they obtain the data from the human game, Go game, or sometimes they are using uh, Monte Carlo tree search method to make some games. So I think this part is maybe depending on domain. This data is coming from internet or your smartphone or Amazon and Google may have different uh, distributions. Probably if you are, you become an engineer at Coupang, AI engineer, you may have different data distribution, regionally, nationally, or your market size, uh, or your product, depending on all those elements, you may have different um, data distributions. And among these data distributions, how are you going to choose training data set, validation data set, and test data set? And you may need some background of statistics and data science. Also, you may have to have very good uh, amount of uh, data knowledge in your domains. Because I'm electrical engineers, I have very good idea about what's voltage current and S parameters and, and radiation patterns. And there are many different eye diagrams. So I can rightly choose, oh, let's assume that we are simulating the eye diagram. So we have to do the, whether you're gonna use the PRBS patterns or RGB patterns, depending on the applications and coding of, or of the data generation might be quite different. Also, also, let's think about if we have the data, let's assume this is data, and let's assume this is probability of data. And majority of data is in this, majority of data is in this area, and there are some minority data is here. you have to make a decision whether, whether you're gonna only use the majority or there might be one, uh, one uh, choice, could be you just use the majority T data for A, B, C. You can choose all this data, A, B, C, training data set, validation data set, and test data set from this point. Another case is here we neglect minority, minority data. Also, we can think about uh, majority plus minority for A, B, C. Third case is minority ABC. So it's related to democracies. If you or you only, for the case of A, majority of opinion and characteristic will be uh, trained in your machine learning model. Your machine learning will behave for these people or for this product or for these informations. So, uh, Sometimes when you are doing all this, probably you can also think about your own philosophy, ethics, environment. Sometimes these are becoming more important considerations. So selection, I would say data process and selection is going to be very uh, important part of your uh, machine learning developing process because it will affect accuracy and resources, probably some of ethics and environment issues. Let's spend a little bit time about data 
pre-processed. Let's assume that you are collecting data from group, your group. Let's assume that um, 1.7, that is the height meter scale, and then weight, this could be weight, probably this might be IQ number, or probably this might be blood pressure, or distantly, uh, this one is, uh, for my case, this could be man, uh, probably maybe some distal number. What I'm saying is that when you are collecting data, there are many different type of data will be collected together. Some of them are analog type of data some of them are digital type of data. Are we gonna are you gonna use this X mate X vector for machine learning input? Are we gonna use directly this one? Number one issue associated with data is one number one part is analog type, the other part is digital type. In the digital type case, it is a just digital number. Analog type has continuous number. How are we gonna treat both together? I probably, I, I don't have my personal experience to develop machine learning for these cases, but these are my imaginations. How are we gonna use this data? Are we gonna directly use this one? And if we are directly using this, uh, data as an input, probably IQ and probably blood pressure has more impact on the accuracy and the performance of this machine learning algorithm because these, these are very small these numbers. So in order to make your machine learning more accurate related to your height, then you, you have to have more time on iterations of machine learning training. So to, there might be not a golden rule, but I would say this is a one method we can do that. Let's assume that you have this type of data, uh, data, uh, data, then you can move up to the center. So uh, I, I, I would suggest to apply this equation, then what we can do is that we can move from center to zero. So then in this case, we have plus region, minus region, plus region, minus region. It is more balanced. Uh, people have more experience saying that if you have more average is near zero, people are saying that it takes less time for the training to reach up to an accuracy. Also, you can adjust uh, this uh, distribution number saying that it is uh, somehow regular size. I think this type of data pre-process is very essential part of your machine learning model development. Without machine learning uh, data, you, we cannot train them. Of course, there are certain cases like uh, reinforcement learning, we can generate the data from the computer, but still we need a computer. And how we, are we going to do the pre-process of data? It will affect significantly on the performance of your machine learning model. I think uh, this area are most uh, very important area 
but because this data are really uh, depending on your domain and business, I think in order to be a good machine learning model, you have to have a good understanding of data and data process. And I also, I, I believe that you have some, ex you need some experience. It is not written on the textbook, uh, but uh, you may have to work hard or to accumulate some experiences. Now I would like to discuss about the data generation. I think this is more uh, important, I think for the future direction, I believe this is future direction of, of machine learning scientists and engineers. If you rely on the personal uh, connections uh, it will be very expensive. So in order to achieve this data generation using the computer, uh, you need more computing power. For example, let's, for example, let's have, we have on images, we can uh, generate, we can generate images, images by changing the angle. The angle, probably light, probably you can change the season. You can also change the distance. Oh, okay, you can create new images by applying the rotation method. Also you can move or you can make a large image or also you can add or change background. Also you can change the color. So mix, you can also create a new images so using the mixture of images. Also, computer can create a new images using GAN algorithm. We're gonna spend some uh, hours next uh, in April to talk about um, this GAN algorithm. So these are a few examples. Uh, let's think about we have CNN model and you input the images and it will uh, generate, the output will be classifications. Let's assume that if you have millions of images, you can do the this training, but if can if you can generate maybe billions of images using this uh, augmented reality and virtual reality and computing power, you can generate the new images. Um, as I mentioned a few minutes before, data pre-process is very important. And I also mentioned that data selection is also very important. This is number one consideration, and this could be number two considerations, I would say. And number three consideration is sometimes data is not enough uh, if you also sometimes data is very expensive. Sometimes some uh, group of people pay more attention to the privacy. So what we can do is generate data using the computers. And this generated data, data can be used to train the convolution neural network or RNN or 
some uh, reinforcement learning. I think these are the another area which we can work on to make our machine learning more useful and more powerful. Now, uh, let's talk about a drop out method. Let's assume that you have certain model, deep neural network model. It has full connection Let's assume you developed machine learning model and you have full connection connections. Dropout model means that you remove certain remove some connections. or nodes or layers. Of course, if you can do that, it will be faster and cheaper. It will become. So what I would say is that in this uh, dropout model, some of them are connected, but not all of them are connected. Very simple connection. So one approach is that Let's assume that you once developed uh, this machine learning model. You check the accuracy and time by removing one by one. My, of course, you have to develop certain algorithm to choose what is the first one to remove and what is the first one to add. And sequentially, probably sequentially, you can do repeated uh, this iteration that, oh, you can found that some WIJ can be, IJ can be removed, but still accuracy is the same. And with, with the same amount of electrical power and data, then uh, you can remove some co certain connections and nodes and layer. If the accuracy is the still same on the same environment, then I would say this is much faster and cheaper model. This is drop out method. Little bit uh, simple work, but still I think there are sometimes if your machine learning model is too heavy, this is too heavy. And no, amount of, w, let's assume that this is number of WIJ, let's assume this is performance. It is, will saturate a certain point. That is what I believe. Uh, if our dream is that our expectation could be linearly increasing, but engineering does not behave like that. In many cases, it saturates. So you have to find such a number of interconnection that can still keep you the, you the same accuracy. Then uh, this kind of method is called Uh, drop our method. Um, now uh, let let me talk about another issues associated with. The, uh, the, uh, the first uh, machine learning uh, development that is called uh, hyperparameter designs. How, how are we gonna choose 
the certain uh, parameter size to have be best performance, um, I would say uh, we have to apply the search method First method is the grid search. Let's assume that you have hyperparameter one and hyperparameter uh, two, H1 and H2. Initially, you have to try certain sets of sets of parameter, hyperparameters. And we don't know what is the right answer. Of course, gradient descent method will, has been used for when we are optimizing the weight matrices, but, um, but hyperparameters are not, uh, not easy to apply the gradient descent method yet. In order to apply the gradient descent method, we have to develop some equations to to make the prediction and also we have to apply we have to develop derivation of the um, uh, of the uh, differentiations which we have done for sigmoid functions and cost softmax functions but in many cases we, we do not know the mathematics yet especially for the parameters such as how many layers we have to use or how many nodes we have to use and what should be the optimal uh, vector size in convolution neural network? We also have to determine the filter size, filter matrix size. There are not uh, a concrete mathematics yet. If we have a good mathematics, we can apply the gradient distance. We can define the cost function and we can define the gradient distance function. But still, even though we are using the gradient distance method, we have to do the iteration of forward propagation and backward propagations. But in many cases, hyperparameter selections, we can uh, apply the grid search method. We can choose many different cases. Uh, this is, let's assume that hyperparameter set one, this is hyperparameter set two, hyperparameter set three, hyperparameter set four, and hyperparameter five, hyperparameter six, hyperparameter seven, hyperparameter eight, hyperparameter nine. So you have to uh, check your model for, for nine, nine, nine cases. Uh, this, uh, this kind of approach is called grid search. Another type of, so when you are conducting your term project in this semester, anyway, you have to develop very simple machine learning model and you have to demonstrate that. Initially, when you are designing, you have to decide the hyperparameters. What should be the number of layer? What should be num uh, the number of nodes? And what should be the filter size? And what should be the initial uh, numbers for those matrices? And so you, you can think about what should be. You can just uh, try a certain number of cases and then you can choose the best case. But if you have enough computing power, you can choose this hyper hyperparameter search method. Second uh, search method is random search. Let's assume that you have parameter H1 and H, H1 and H2. H2, there could be some random positions. And this is another possible way uh, to do that. If you, uh, you do the uh, grid search, if there are certain point in the middle of, or some corner somewhere here, uh, then you will never reach that point. But randomness also uh, can be a, a possible method to do the grid search. Third method is hybrid search. Let's assume you start with a uh, grid, grid type, and then you, you found that this has the best performance, then you can do the random, random search around that point to find the best uh, parameters. 
uh, these are the method to use uh, in the uh, hyperparameter search method. So as I mentioned before, I was talking about uh, some issues related to the, the pre-preparation of data and performance improvement. I was talking about data distribution is very important. Also, also I mentioned about data pre-process number two. Number three is the also sometimes we can generate data using computers, number three. I think number four is the drop out method that are I think very useful in practical uh, machine learning design process. Number five is the how to choose the hyperparameters. And such a method is I would strongly ask you to consider. If you become really uh, good uh, software AI engineer, uh, you may have to work on uh, these issues very, very intensively. Um, another issue which I would like to discuss a little bit uh, right now is the early stop issue. Let's assume that this is number of training. I mean, training means forward propagation and backward propagation iterations. When you are training your machine learning or validation process, training process and also validation, validation and test, or, or you have to determine this number. It could be thousand or millions or hundred, depending on your data size or depending on your requirement of accuracy. But anyway, what this is, let's assume this is accuracy. Initially, we can think, we can, uh, think that if we keep training, the accuracy will bring it down to certain uh, number. But in many cases, uh, people got experience saying that uh, this accuracy will go on. Again, if you are trained too much, I think it may, it's if you prepare exam for final exam for your other classes, sometimes you spend time for preparing the classes. There might be certain optimal uh, amount of time to be used when you are preparing your classes. Because if you study too much, sometimes it does not need to be a very accurate answer. So there are some points that you have to stop your training. That point is, I would say, only stop, only stopping point. Another consideration uh, when you are developing your machine model is that when you are going to stop the training, life is, is not infinite, computing power is not infinite, our data size is not infinite. How are we going to stop? Sometimes this error uh, of, I think the allowable error will determine your accuracy, or sometimes you have to closely monitor this curve. When to stop your training? That is another important issue associated with uh, machine learning actual uh, development process. Another uh, method which I would like to uh, introduce is Ang San method. I'm not 100% sure about the spelling of uh, this writing. Let's assume that you have DNN one model. You have DNN two model. You have, let's assume that you have DNN three model. One possibility is that you can add them and 
average. Make an average and then you can do the decision. This model one, two, three may be developing with a different model data set or hyperparameters. meters and one to six. I mentioned about many different methods, only stop time and grid uh, uh, search method and dropout method and data generation method, data preparation method and data select distribution and selection method. So you, there might be hundred different type of considerations when you are developing your DNN models. If you are not so much confident then you can make an average to make a decision. This is one of the, uh, also uh, this model can uh, maybe developed from different engineers or companies. Yes. Uh, this is another method to be uh, used when you are developing a practical uh, machine learning and and then competitive again let's go back to the initial uh, slide when i starting this class here i mentioned about uh, design consideration to improve the your dnm performance and of course, we have to think about accuracy, resources, data size, speed, cost, and flexibility, and expandability, and usability. Also, uh, you have to consider your ethics and environment. So, in the small scale, uh, um, model development is related to what kind of activation function you're going to use, and what kind of cost function you're going to use, and uh, what kind of data you're going to use. But in their development of your machine learning models, you have to think about uh, this kind of approaches. I would say you have to think about uh, data pre-process and selection and data augmentation and generation, throughout method, parameter search method, overfitting issues and early stopping issues and so on. Uh, this is the end of my class today. Uh, on Wednesday, uh, I would suggest you to come to, all of you come to the class. I'm going to give you a lecture on, on this Wednesday, I'm going to talk about overview, overview of class, especially deep reinforcement learning. What is the purpose of our class? why I'm talking about tissue issues and dead issues, and I'm gonna wanna give you overall pictures with the related to AlphaGo. I'm going, you haven't, uh, we haven't uh, studied detail about the specific models such as CNN, RNN, and GAN, and LSTM, and so on. But now this is the end of March, and I, I talked about the many design issues associated with the deep learning. Now it's time to move a little bit. Uh, I would like to jump into the AlphaGo and deep reinforcement learning. Then you can figure out what is my intention. Also, it can bring more of your uh, interest and motivation to focus on this class. And thank you for your attention and see you on Wednesday.